Join me as I unravel AI's success in a scenario where modern medicine has its limitations. Preeclampsia is a medical condition where a pregnant woman's blood pressure gets to be dangerously high. It occurs in about 5 to 7% of all pregnant women and is considered the leading cause of maternal deaths in the United States. Doctors and scientists have spent decades trying to understand the causes of preeclampsia, but without much success. In fact, preeclampsia can only be predicted when it actually occurs, at about 20 weeks of pregnancy. 20 weeks, that is halfway through the pregnancy when it is too late to do anything about the bad outcomes. So what do we need to do to prevent this disease, which has immeasurable emotional and societal costs, not to mention over $2 billion that is spent annually to, in terms of medical care. My team and I have come up with a two-pronged approach. First, identify the patients who are most at risk of this disease and those at the lowest risk so that we can target tests and treatments only to the patients who really need them. Second, identify the patients who are most at risk early enough in the pregnancy so that we can take actions to prevent this disease. My team, over the past few years, has made significant progress towards to these two goals. In fact, we have identified some biomarkers that can predict the occurrence of preeclampsia in new patients as early as 11 to 13 weeks. I'll unpack the details of our approach as well as our results in a few minutes. But first, let me give you the big picture. My students and I at the Distributed Artificial Intelligence Research Lab at Hunter College designed computer programs to address problems like preeclampsia and other such challenges and opportunities. These computer programs, also called AI algorithms, are like super helpers. Think of them as really clever assistants that can help you solve problems. This is because they can reason about goals, their deadlines, and their costs. These algorithms can be used to solve complex problems that affect humanity. So recently, there has been significant interest, as you know, and enthusiasm in AI. And at the same time, the media has been rife with dystopian scenarios that can be caused by AI. So in my talk today, I'm going to help demystify AI for you, tell you what it is, what it is not, and where it is going. So let's begin with what is AI. Artificial intelligence is the science and engineering of building machines that can behave intelligently. What then is intelligence? The human brain is the pinnacle of biological intelligence, and indeed, it's a great wonder. It is capable of doing really complex tasks, such as perceptions, learning, reasoning, communicating in multiple languages, and most importantly, abstract level thinking. So AI algorithms, such as generative AI algorithms, as well as neural networks and deep learning, are inspired by the network structure of neurons in the brain. However, the goal of AI is not to recreate the brain. Humans exceptionally excel at creativity, common sense reasoning, and the ability to adapt to new situations that they have never seen before. AI and machine learning, on the other hand, they can also find patterns in large amounts of data very quickly. However, these AI algorithms are not quite capable of the deep understanding and the comprehension that is characteristic of human cognition. There has been, again, a lot of interest in AI, but it's not because it's a new technology. In fact, research in AI and began in the 1950s. And I myself began my research in AI as an undergraduate in 1995. DARPA, which is the R&D arm of the Department of Defense, outlines the evolution of AI in three waves of this technology. So the first wave involves the creation of rules by experts, rules such as, if you see this, then do that, for very specific applications. 
such as medical diagnosis or chess playing or finance. So these first wave systems take these rules, apply logical reasoning, and actually do very well in these very narrow domains. However, they were not able to handle situations for which they were, did not have the rules because they did not have the capability to learn. The second generation or the second wave of AI systems addresses this knowledge gap. So these algorithms were not told what to do, but they were given the capability to learn and adapt in new situations. And how do they do that? They use very sophisticated statistical methods and probabilistic algorithms to find patterns in large amounts of data and use that knowledge, which we call machine learning models, and then apply it in new data that they haven't seen before. This, of course, is called machine learning. You are using machine learning when you, for example, tag your friend in a set of photos on your photo app in your phone. And then the algorithm picks up this information and is able to tag and identify your friend in every other photo that they occur in photo app. Did you know you are using AI when you access your favorite streaming service to watch a movie? Suppose you're nostalgic for, say, Marvel movies and decide to watch the movie Thor. You know, by the end of the movie, you're going to have a set of recommendations on the bottom, such as movies like Thor Ragnarok or Supergirl or Justice League. This, my friends, is the magic of recommendation systems powered by AI algorithms. They have made a significant impact on industry in that they've allowed for the sale of products which were difficult to market previously while accessing users who were difficult to be accessed before. However, these algorithms do have their own quirks. Suppose you're bored one day and decide to watch the first documentary you see on your streaming service, and it's about penguins. So the next time you log in, you're going to see your screen blasted with all kinds of penguin movies and animations and documentaries, even though you're not really that interested in penguins. So, Feedback is significantly important in making sure that the results produced by these algorithms jive with user preferences. And at the same time, skewed data can lead to results which are bizarre at best and catastrophic at worst. So these prediction and classification algorithms have been around for quite a while. Think of them as super smart robot friends who can help you produce text or generate images or compose music in response to prompts that you provide. These generative algorithms, like the ones used in chatbots, are trained on large amounts, ginormous amounts of text, using very, very powerful computers. And what they're really doing is that they're able to predict the next word given a certain amount of text. This, interestingly enough, leads to what one would think are lucid and actually intelligent conversations that these algorithms are able to have with their human users. However, these algorithms do not have a deep understanding of either the prompts or the results that they are producing. It is not human-like understanding, which means at times they can produce results which are awkward or inaccurate. In tech terms, this is called hallucination. And so it is important to make sure that you check for the accuracy and the bias in the results when using these systems. So the second wave of AI systems are indeed able to adapt to new data and situations that they haven't seen before because they are capable of doing machine learning. The third wave of AI systems really is addressing one of the main goals of what, why AI was invented, uh, which is they design AI algorithms which can collaborate and cooperate and communicate with other AI algorithms, as well as with their human users and while understanding the broader context. As a computer scientist, 
My North Star has to been to build such algorithms, which seamlessly weave solutions together between both human users and AI algorithms to solve complex problems which are of importance to humanity. Some of the projects that my team and I have worked the past two decades include designing algorithms for tracking tornadoes across Oklahoma while making sure that we can do this early enough so that the loss of life and property can be avoided. Second, we also have built algorithms which can ensure that Wi-Fi connectivity is maintained as people move through a building using their mobile devices by ensuring that the network resources are efficiently load balanced using AI algorithms. We have also simulated a smart home where resources like hot water, electricity, and gas are traded off to be used efficiently while keeping the occupants safe and comfortable. And more recently, we have developed algorithms for reducing traffic congestion and emissions in large cities like New York. A common methodology that cuts across most of our projects is the use of two complementary mathematical processes. Namely, sequential decision making, which involves a series of decisions that are made, where the decisions that are made early on affect the options that are available later on. The second is machine learning, which as you know, is pattern recognition. So let me now explain to you how sequential decision making and machine learning is used in the context of preeclampsia, the problem that I introduced early on. This is work that we have done with the Prace Lab team at Columbia University and the Medical Center. The data that we use in this work is from a large scale study done by the National Institute of Health. It consists of multiple visits done by 10,000 first time mothers throughout their pregnancy and the information that is co collected during their visits. In fact, we collect 3,000 data points per patient during this study. And these data points or features in machine learning team in terms are examples of this would be age, their height, their weight, their diet, their exercise, their blood pressure, socioeconomic information, genetic information, psychological surveys, and physiological information. The secret sauce of our approach and why it works is that we were able to integrate information from multiple databases about each patient and then apply our sophisticated mathematical methods on this data. And what we discovered are these subtle dependencies between the features as well as between the features and the primary outcome, which in our case is the risk of preeclampsia. So this is how we found that there were certain biomarkers that could indicate the risk of preeclampsia as early as 11 to 13 weeks, even though the actual onset of preeclampsia is not until 20 weeks. This was considered a success story by our medical colleagues because it gives them enough time to take preventive actions so that the disease can be avoided in new patients. While our models did very well for most of the patient data, there were two subgroups for which the performance was a little underwhelming. The first group was non-Hispanic black women, and the second subgroup was Asian American women. So when we dug into the data and the models to understand what, what was going on, why is it underperforming for these two particular subgroups, found that patients from these two subgroups were underrepresented in the training data, and that was one of the reasons. So once we had understood the reason, we were able to correct the model and the bias in our models and the performance of our models for these subgroups matched the performance for the majority groups. Our approach is versatile enough to be applied for preeclampsia, but also for other medical con conditions. In fact, we can generalize it for non-medical applications such as critical infrastructure. How many of you remember 
the events of August 29th, 2023. Okay. <laughs> so let me help you re recall. At 3 a.m. that Tuesday morning, a 20-inch pipeline under Times Square burst, releasing 1.8 million gallons of water into the subway system, flooding the subways, stopping the one, two, and three lines, and affecting the commute of 300,000 passengers in just that morning. New York City has 7,400 miles of pipe underneath the city. And many of them are in great need of being repaired or replaced on a regular basis, just because some of these pipes were built as far back as the 1890s. However, determining which pipe needs to be replaced at the highest priority is not an easy problem for two reasons. The first is that the longevity of a pipe depends on multiple factors, such as the age of the pipe, the diameter, the material used for the pipe, information about soil resistivity and pressure zone, and even determining if there is underground root growth for trees. The second reason is that New York City does not have accurate maps of its pipe infrastructure. So how are we going to predict which pipe is going to burst next or need repair if we do not have accurate maps? In comes the help of artificial intelligence. So my students currently in my lab are in the process of integrating data from multiple databases about all the factors that could affect the longevity of a pipe. And then we are going to apply the same mathematical methods that we used for preeclampsia to be able to predict the pipe which is going to burst next. And also do this, try to do this early enough so that we can fix the pipe before it actually bursts and thus prevent the bad outcomes. As an educator, I train the next generation of AI professionals by teaching them both about the foundations and the fundamentals of AI and also the practical applications. Francis Bacon in 1609 in The Wisdom of the Ancients said, the mechanical arts are of ambiguous use, serving as well for hurt as for remedy. I believe this is true for AI as well. In fact, when I teach my AI class, I do emphasize the great opportunity and the unprecedented potential that AI technologies can bring to this world. But I also strongly encourage my students to have a clear-eyed perspective of the challenges of this technology. Challenges such as making sure that the data is coming from trusted sources, making sure that the data is not intentionally biased, that the reasoning and the decision process is transparent and in interpretable. And finally, making sure that misinformation is not being spread. This is called responsible AI, and it's both a technical and a governance issue. This is because it's important to work and create these algorithms within the guardrails of making sure the risks are contained, while at the same time, we want to allow for enough flexibility for innovation. I truly believe that if AI is done responsibly, it can empower the individual, not devalue them. In fact, AI can help foster a resilient society where individuals can pursue their own personal dreams while shaping a harmonious coexistence with technology. Thank you.